<coughs> Welcome to today's Merrill seminar. Please introduce Adam Lyons, uh, our colleague from here at the Merrill, talking about the Lake District and Wordsworth's legacy. Thanks, Ollie. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm quite humbled to see the amount of people that have come to see this today, so hopefully you won't be disappointed. Those of you that know me will know that two of the biggest passions that I have in my life are for Wordsworth and the Lake District. Um, so thank you all for coming along and indulging that this afternoon. Um, I've known the lakes pretty much all of my life. In fact, it's probably fair to say that I know the geography of the Lake District more than I do the geography of my home county of Warwickshire. Um, so as a result of that, I've long been interested in the links between the poet William Wordsworth and his native land, and the way that his legacy and his writing has shaped the geography of the area that we know today. Um, some of you that know me will know that before I worked here at Merle, um, I spent a year at the Wordsworth Trust in Grasmere. Um, and since I've been here at Merle, I've noticed that bits of our collections tie in quite nicely with the theme of this talk. So I've been working this talk through in my head for a number of years now. So uh, thank you all for coming. I'm going to talk for a bit, hopefully not too long, and then you'll have a chance to go through into the seminar room just along the corridor and have a look at some of the collections that... I'm going to mention as part of the talk today. So in 2017, the Lake District National Park was awarded UNESCO World Heritage status, one of the highest accolades of landscape on the planet. It joined other global sites such as the Grand Canyon and the Great Wall of China. UNESCO cited the area's beauty, its farming, and cultural inspiration as the key factors in gaining the status, something that the area had been trying for since 1986. The report submitted by the committee behind its bid featured Wordsworth prominently, using his descriptions to introduce the chapters on each valley. So how did the Lake District get to this point, and how did Wordsworth become such a key part of it? The area we now recognise as the Lake District has existed physically for millions of years and has been carved out by the slow process of glaciation. It covers approximately 912 square miles and attracts 15.8 million visitors each year. What interests me is the way that the area has been identified throughout history, particularly the last 300 years. <coughs> for centuries, it was divided into the ancient counties of Westmoreland, Cumberland and North Lancashire. In 1951, the Lake District National Park was created and its boundaries carved through the traditional dividing lines of the three counties. As part of the Local Government Act of 1972, the three counties were combined to form the modern county of Cumbria in 1974. So already we can see the hallmarks of many geographical understandings of the region. The development of the Lake District as a distinct geographical unit is a fascinating one and has been shaped by visitors, painters and writers over several centuries. It's hard to imagine it today, but the area has not always been loved and celebrated for the beauty of its landscape. Go back only 300 years and you'll find an entirely different response. The writer Daniel Defoe, perhaps best known for Robinson Crusoe, recorded his observations of the region in his hugely successful a tour through the whole island of Great Britain published in 1724 and 1727. After visiting Preston in Lancashire, he found the Lake District to be poor, sparsely populated and strange. Of the hills, he remarked, they had the kind of unhospitable terror in them. Here were no rich, pleasant valleys between them, as among the Alps, no lead mines and veins of rich ore, as in the Peak, no coal pits, as in the hills about Halifax, much less gold, as in the Andes, but all barren and wild, of no use or advantage either to man or beast, a country imminent for being the wildest, most barren and frightful of any that I have passed over in England. Um, Defoe does little here to entice travellers to the region <laughs> and almost dismisses it entirely. Defoe's description isn't even wholly concerned with the region's aesthetics, rather its ability or lack of to be cultivated for human use. The region is remote and isolated. Travel to, let alone within it, would have been arduous. Even if a traveller penetrated the lakes at this time, they lacked the aesthetic frameworks with which to appreciate and consume it. This, however, began to change steadily as the 18th century progressed. In 1757, the philosopher Edmund Burke published his treatise, 
a philosophical inquiry into the origin of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful. This influential and widely read work held that aesthetic appreciation and interpretation could be broadly split into two camps, the sublime and the beautiful. To be described as sublime, something should demonstrate greatness of dimension, be rugged and be dark and gloomy. Anything beautiful, in contrast, should be smooth and polished, as well as light and delicate. But this is only the start. Out of this work of aesthetic theory came a more influential movement, the picturesque. This was to transform the way in which we appreciate landscape, and its legacy lives on in the way we admire them today. The term picturesque meant literally in the manner of a picture, or fit to be made into a picture. Landscapes could be interpreted by the rules of a painting, and a landscape's value would lie in its ability to offer views that contained all the essential qualities of a good landscape painting. The Lake District, luckily, offered these views in abundance and finally had the aesthetic frameworks in place to encourage a timely reassessment. The Cumberland-born Reverend William Gilpin is widely recognised as the father of picturesque theory in England. He published successful volumes on the picturesque in which he related it directly to landscape specifically the Lake District. His observations relative chiefly to picturesque beauty made in the year 1772 celebrated the riches to be found by travellers and artists, offering suggestions on the best places in which to do it, and it didn't take long for this to catch on. The first Lake District tourists were enticed by the writings of William Gilpin and other travel writers who were beginning to report the picturesque qualities of the landscape to an already eager market. The early tourists were the same wealthy and cultured individuals used to the grand tour of the continent. Early writers engaged this connection by comparing the Lake District's district scenery with that of the Alps, some even suggesting that the lakes provided more variety in its scenery. As the 18th century drew to a close, the troubles in France only increased the numbers swapping the scenery of the continent for the scenery at home. The vast majority of these tourists came equipped with painting and sketching material and the essential tool in any picturesque tourist arsenal, the Claude glass. This device, named after the French landscape <coughs> painter, consisted of a dark mirror, convex in shape, bound like a pocketbook. The user would turn their back to the view they wished to capture, hold up the dark tinted glass, which reduced the landscape into a manageable size while simplifying the color range. The writer Thomas Gray, popularised the use of it in his successful journal of his tour of the Lake District, published in 1775. His employment of a Claude glass was a very serious thing, although it's not surprising that his escapades and those of others became the subject of satire. For example, as he crossed Windermere to reach the viewing station on the other side, he put on a blindfold so he didn't spoil the surprise for himself. <laughs> After lunch in Keswick, Gray recalls that he staggered out alone to the parsonage fell down on my back across a dirty lane with my glass open in one hand, but broke my knuckles, stayed nevertheless, and saw the sun set in all its glory. Uh, broken knuckles are a happy exchange for an unscathed clawed glass and a perfect picturesque view. <laughs> a hungry audience of tourists needed guiding. Gilpin's and Gray's tours were well read, but the guidebook that did more than anything to popularise the picturesque Lake District in the 18th century was written by Thomas West. His Guide to the Lakes, published in 1778, went through several editions in a little over 20 years. West began as Gilpin and Gray had left off, but his major contribution was the listing of key stations, the best places from which to admire the most picturesque views. His guide describes how a tourist could get to them and tells them the elements of the landscapes they should capture. And the introduction opens with, the design of the following sheets is to encourage the taste of visiting the lakes by furnishing the traveller with a guide. And for that purpose, the writer has here collected and laid before him all the select stations and points of view. The area was becoming so popular at this point that writers began to comment on it. Author and diarist Hester Lynch Piozzi in 1789 exclaimed, there is a rage for the lakes. We travel to them, we row upon them, we write about them. Fueled by the desire for the full picturesque experience, some visitors sought to enhance the landscape and even intensify it. 
In the 1790s, a structure was added to the site of Thomas West's Windermere Station. Clave Station was the only station to have a structure built on it and has recently been restored by the National Trust. It's a two-storey structure that had a dining room and a wine cellar on the ground floor and a drawing room hung with landscape paintings on the first floor, a place to wine and dine the picturesque. The most important element, however, was the large window on the first floor, deliberately facing and framing the view. Around the outside, coloured glass enabled visitors to cloak the landscape in whatever atmosphere they wanted and at any time of the year. Yellow for summer, orange for autumn, light green for spring, and so on. A legacy, I'd say, that is still with us today in the form of Instagram filters. <laughs> An Aeolian harp was even placed in an open window for the wind to catch its strings and provide harmonic overtones. Some travellers who could afford it would pay to be taken out on a steamer out onto the lakes, not just so they could view the landscape from the surface of the lake, they wanted to hear and feel it too. Cannons were let off so that the echoes down the valleys would give the impression of terror that the landscape was falling in on them. Merely 70 years before, Defoe had been turned off by the terror of the hills. Now tourists were actively seeking it. So this is where we find the Lake District at the close of the 18th century. Certainly the area would have continued to attract tourists without Wordsworth, but the future of the region, particularly its conservation, would have been very different. Both deliberately and accidentally, at times conscious and unconsciously, Wordsworth's life and work had a profound impact on what was to come. So where, where does Wordsworth fit in all of this? He was born in Cockermouth in 1770 and grew up amongst the lakes and hills of the Lake District. Later in life, he reflected on the schooling he had received from nature and his love affair with the Lake District in particular. Aside from his time at university in Cambridge, visits to the continent, and living in the south of England, he spent the majority of his life in his native land. He and his sister Dorothy refer returned to the Lake District when Wordsworth was 29 in 1799. On Christmas Eve, they moved into a small dwelling on the outskirts of Grasmere, now known as Dove Cottage, and set about establishing a plainer existence surrounded by the hills and lakes from their childhoods. The years that followed saw Wordsworth produce some of his best work. He worked on poems for lyrical ballads, a volume he collaborated on with his friend and fellow poet Coleridge, and a work that has come to define the Romantic movement. He wrote his famous Daffodils poem and began work on his epic biographical poem, The Prelude, which would eventually be published after his death in 1850. His sister also wrote and recorded moments from their daily life at Grasmere in her journal, rightly celebrated for its subtle and intricate descriptions of the landscape. Wordsworth married the love of his life, Mary Hutchinson, in 1802, and they started their family at Dove Cottage. These years were some of the happiest in his life, marked by daily explorations of the landscape around him. He walked so much that the writer de Quincey estimated that he'd walked over 300,000 miles in his lifetime, although I don't think anyone's quite sure where he came up with that figure. Uh, many of the poems from this period detail the spots in the local area dear to him and his family, but also the lives of the local population. His was an intense daily communion with nature. The growing popularity of the Lake District at this time was not far away from their life in Grasmere. In June 1800, Dorothy records in her journal, a coroneted Landau went by when we were sitting upon the sodded wall. The ladies, evidently tourists, turned an eye of interest upon our little garden and cottage. By the time Wordsworth published his own guide to the region, the guidebook market was already saturated. This saturation was well understood by the writers themselves. George Tattersall, in his preface to the guide The Lakes of England from 1836, comments on adding another to the already numberless guides, commenting that it is a path which has been so completely beaten by his predecessors as to leave but little hope of novelty. Novelty, novelty was certainly lacking by the early 19th century. Most picturesque guidebooks simply repeated the suggestions of those before them and waxed lyrical about the same views, perhaps updating uh, information about roads and places to stay. Wordsworth, while following certain picturesque criteria, achieved something greater with his own offering, which made it a cut above the picturesque. The key difference was that Wordsworth not only told readers what they could see in the landscape, but how it could make them feel.
One of the best passages from his guide is his discussion of the region's climate. Here he is operating at a higher level, and it's one of my favourite extracts. He takes the reader to the side of a lake. <coughs> All else speaks of tranquility. Not a breath of air, no restlessness of insects, and not a moving object perceptible. Except the clouds gliding in the depths of the lake, or the traveller passing along, an inverted image whose motion seems governed by the quiet of time to which its archetype, the living person, is perhaps insensible. Or it may happen that the figure of one of the larger birds, a raven or a heron, is crossing silently among the reflected clouds, while the voice of the real bird from the element aloft gently awakens in the spectator the recollection of appetites and instincts, pursuits and occupations that deform and agitate the world yet have no power to prevent nature from putting on an aspect capable of satisfying the most intense cravings for the tranquil, the lovely and the perfect, to which man, the noblest of her creatures, is subject. Apart from the clouds, the clouds gliding in the depths of the lake, the traveller passing along and the birds crossing silently, all else in this scene is still, an image frozen in time. What's interesting about this passage is that it begins by imparting what is not present. Not a breath of air, no restlessness of insects, and not a moving object perceptible. It is as if it is as though he is emptying the scene of features as to offer the potential for it to be filled by the spectator. Gone are the dense topographical sweeps of picturesque writers. Wordsworth is much more concerned with naming and locating distinct features of the natural environment that appeal and stand out most to him. He lists what he happens to experience, rather than determining what the reader should look out for and capture in such a moment. Wordsworth is less prescribing elements worthy of attention, rather, in, rather empowering the spectator to make their own. Perhaps the most obvious contrast between this and other picturesque writers is that Wordsworth hadn't, hasn't identified where this moment took place. We know it's a lake within the Lake District, but we don't know which one. This is far from the idea of set stations. It marks a shift from a picturesque appreciation of the scene and the need to draw all of the elements there to a more literary and spiritual response to the area, one, I would argue, that is more human. Throughout his guide, Wordsworth celebrates his native region as a holistic, natural environment, demonstrating knowledge of geological phenomena and an awareness of each valley having a unique and tightly balanced ecosystem. As a result, his guide has been identified as an early environmental text, in it, he mapped out the valleys of the region from a central point, which he pivots roughly above the village of Grasmere. He says, We shall then see stretched out at our feet a number of valleys, not fewer than eight, diverging from the point on which we are supposed to stand, like spokes from the nave of a wheel. Wordsworth lays out his geographical distinctions of the area in the image of a cartwheel, whose spokes extend to mark the outer limits of the Lake District. This topographical description of the region's geography has had more impact than any other in defining what we now recognise as the Lake District. His call for it to be a sort of national property in which every man has a right and interest who has an eye to perceive and a heart to enjoy is often cited as the kernel that set in motion thoughts of protection, of defining the geography of the region in order to preserve it. Ironically, for someone known primarily as a poet, one of Wordsworth's best-selling works during his lifetime was this Guide to the Lakes, first published anonymously in 1810 to accompany engravings of Lake District scenes, and then republished several times in the poet's name. The archive of his publisher, Longmans of London, which we hold here in special collections, revealed the impressive run of sales. This example from 1822 edition shows a run of 500 quickly followed a year later by an edition stretching out to a thousand volumes. His golden decade of writing during his time at Grasmere was over before his work started to be more widely read and celebrated, and with this, his fame grew too. By the time he had settled in his final home at Rydal Mount, a few miles south of Grasmere, he had become a tourist destination in his own right. The first time a writer's home had become a tourist destination while the writer was still living there. This process operated in a circle. Visits to Rydal Mount increased, as Wordsworth was mentioned more in guidebooks, and more visitors encouraged guidebook writers to quote the poet's work in their volumes. 
tourist would peer over the hedges of the garden to try and spot the poet, take snippets from his garden, and even attend the local church just for a chance to be near him. This period marks a shift slightly from the pure picturesque tourism of the 18th century to the literary tourism of the 19th century. What appealed so much to guidebook writers about Wordsworth's poetry was that it was richly topographical, with a huge focus on the Lake District. The Excursion, published in 1814, was the first of Wordsworth's volumes to sell well. It is an extended poem over nine books, part of which details a route through the Lake District taken by the characters of the poem. The River Dodden of 1820 is a sonnet sequence tracing the river from its source downstream. The popularity of these works owes something to their quality, but also the ever-growing market for things linked to the Lake District. For guidebook writers, these works by Wordsworth were gold dust. They offered the chance to market new sites to the tourists, especially after the repetitive cycle that the picturesque guide market had suffered. Wordsworth's personal connections with the landscape and the way he and his family named features after associations was an unconscious factor in this too. I've already talked a little about Wordsworth's daily life in Grasmere, um, but you can see these maps here. You can almost map out a parallel geography based on the movements of the Wordsworth family. So there are places on there that we recognise today, but there are also personal um, attachments to things such as John's Grove, uh, about their brother, Mary Point and Sarah Point, the Glowworm Rock. Um, so you can see that some of this has made its way into what we understand today. Earlier, he wrote, a set, he wrote a set of poems explicitly related to this, the poems on the naming of places, which form part of lyrical ballads. Explaining the set of five poems, Wordsworth wrote, by persons resident in the country and attached to rural objects, many places will be found unnamed or even unknown names where little incidents will have occurred or feelings been experienced which have given to such places a private and peculiar interest. From a wish to give some sort of record to such incidents or renew the gratification of such feelings, names have been given to places by the author and some of his friends and the following poems written in consequence. This innocent and very human response to the landscape around him and his family has had a big effect on his legacy over the land in the area. More immediately, it paved the way for one of the biggest guidebooks of the region in the 19th century. Black's picturesque guide to the English lakes was first published in 1841, but by the end of the century, it had gone through 22 editions. His use of Wordsworth catapults the poet's associations with the Lake District. Black introduced biographical notes into the guide and drew attention to Dove Cottage at a time when Rydal Mount was still the centre of Wordsworthian tourists. The guide opens with, an interest, however, of no ordinary kind is imparted to the locality from its being in the spot with which many eminent literary men have been more or less connected. In directing the steps of the tourist, we have availed ourselves to a considerable extent of the literature of the district. It's important to take note of the titles of these guidebooks because they mark a shift in the geography of the area. Early guides placed the area firmly within the traditional counties, the lakes of Westmoreland and Cumberland. This continued widely into the 19th century. Wordsworth uses the terms district of the lakes and the lake district in the 1835 edition of his guide marking a subtle but significant shift in the name and identity of the area. From the 1850s, any reference to the counties was dropped and the Lake District was cemented as the title of the area. At this time, the first railway stretched northwards, opening up the region to a wider audience. It reached Lancaster in 1840 and finally Windermere in 1846. Onwind's Pocket Guide to the Lakes of 1841 targeted this new audience and opened with the following statement. I have more especially designed this unpretending collection of hints and suggestions to a class of persons just beginning to be known at a distance from the great marts of trade, even in the furthest and most retired parts of our beautiful island. I allude to the middle or working classes of England, those of limited means, but of liberal mind and increasing taste, a class merging by the all power lever of education. The shorter travel times to the area were marvelled at too. <coughs> in something less than 12 hours, it is now possible to reach Lancaster from London, and in four hours more, the banks of Windermere. 
in light of that quote, it's clear to see just how remote the region was to travellers in the previous century. Not all were thrilled with the coming of the railway. Wordsworth protested it publicly in the form of letters and poems to the Morning Post. His argument centred around the lack of any major industry in the area that required access to a railway, but also touched on the type of visit to the railway was partly designed to encourage. He was worried about the damage and influx of visitors would bring, but there is a hint of aesthetic snobbishness in his argument. His call for the lakes to be a sort of national property is linked with the idea of persons of taste, those he sees with schooling in aesthetic theory and, in his eyes, properly equipped to appreciate the landscape. His concern with the railways to Windermere appear elitist to the modern era. He expresses concern that the railway company will develop entertainments to tempt the factory workers of Lancashire and Yorkshire to the area. He says, we should have wrestling matches, horse and boat races without number, and pot houses and beer shops would keep pace with the excitements and recreations. Despite the language of his protest, Wordsworth was an early recogniser of an issue that still faces beauty spots today simply that the act of enjoying the beauty of nature often destroys it. Wordsworth lost the argument, and many tourists each year still alight at Windermere for the lakes. Wordsworth died in 1850, and within days of his burial, his grave was already attracting tourists, some to collect wildflowers and even the grass from on top of his grave. His death did little to slow his popularity. In fact, Lake District tourism continued to accelerate with a greater emphasis on the link between the poet and his native land. The publication of Wordsworth's epic biographical poem, The Prelude, after his death, provided guidebooks with more Wordsworthian locations, particularly associated with his childhood. In 1878, devoted Wordsworth scholar William Knight published The English Lake District as interpreted in the poems of Wordsworth. In it, he sought to explain the poems through their links with the landscape, and vice versa. Words where spirit and voice were employed to argue <coughs> against other railways in the area in the 19th century, most notably by art critic and adopted Lakelander John Ruskin. His Railways in the Lake District, a protest from 1876, had preservationist intentions, but intensifies Wordsworth's person of taste point. He claims that the working classes would bring with them working class pursuits, such as skittles and drink, at one point shuddering at the idea that mountains might be viewed whilst drunk. <laughs> it would take another inheritor of Wordsworth to offer a more democratic interpretation and vision of the poet's ideas. The Reverend Hardrick Wormsley became the vicar at Low Ray near the northwest shore of Windermere in the 1870s and became a much loved local figure and a figure of national importance through his engagement with the preservation of the Lake District. He recognised that any preservation act must preserve local life. He wanted a permanent Lake District Defence Society and chose the annual meeting of the Wordsworth Society to launch his appeal. Rawnsley declared that neither the patriarch nor we, his humble and very grateful disciples, grudged the fair free use of Lakeland to all sons of toil and doubt. The lakes, argued Rawnsley, should be protected as one of the few recreation grounds open to and within easy distance for the toilers of our northern towns. He would eventually become a co-founder of the National Trust in 1895, a society whose roots can be traced in the early efforts to preserve the Lake District. In 1882, a young Beatrix Potter holidayed close to Low Ray and met Rawnsley. His passion for preserving the Lake District had a lasting impact on her, and she famously used the money from her children's books to buy up thousands of, acre of acres of land in the area. She left her entire property of over 4,000 acres of land to the Trust when she died in 1943. In the early decades of the 20th century, ever-increasing steps were taken to formalise the protection of the Lake District by a variety of groups and organisations. The Addison Committee was formed in 1929 to investigate the feasibility of national parks. On a more local level, a plan to merge the county districts of Cumberland, Westmoreland and North Lancashire into one authority was mooted in the early 1930s, prompting much debate. Files in the Council for the Preservation of Rural England archive from this time contain an array of publications and articles on the topic which employ Wordsworth in their arguments. Safeguarding Lakeland by Ewart Jones opens to all lovers of the English Lake District, a publication of national importance 
followed by extensive quotes from Wordsworth and from Ruskin. The co-founder of the CPRE in 1926, Sir Patrick Abercrombie, wrote, If only Wordsworth's advice had been followed from that date till now, there would have been little need to take the action which is imperatively necessary at this moment. He went on to write the Cumbrian Regional Report of 1932, a beautifully illustrated volume laying out a combined planning approach to secure a system of conservation and development. In it, he promotes Wordsworth as the authoritative voice for the topography of the region, but referred to his guide as the subtlest study upon the subject of the preservation of rural and mountain beauty. He continues with, no apology, therefore, is needed for the large use made of Wordsworth's poetic and didactic writings upon the Lake District. The depression of the 30s and World War II delayed further steps towards a national park system. The interwar period saw an increase in outdoor pursuits, such as hiking, particularly among the working classes. The latter half of the 19th century saw a widening of the tourism market in the Lake District to the middle classes, and the early decades of the 20th century saw this widen even further. Societies such as the Youth Hostel Association promoted outdoor pursuits and affordable accommodation. Together with the CPRE and the Ramblers Association, they lobbied the government for legislation. The national mood shifted in favour of preserving rural areas, especially after the suffering from another world war. Propaganda during the war positioned the countryside as the key reason to fight and save the nation. John Dower's white paper of 1945 was pivotal in establishing the principles of what a national park should be. John Dower says, a national park is an extensive area of beautiful and relatively wild country in which, for the nation's benefit and by appropriate national decision and action, the characteristic landscape beauty is strictly preserved, access and facilities for public open air enjoyment are amply provided, wildlife and buildings and places of architectural and historical interest are suitably protected, while established farming use is effectively maintained. The 1947 report of the National Parks Committee details the areas worthy of the status. In its appendix, Wordsworth and the Lake District lead the way. For a century and a half it opens, those who have loved wild country have counted the Lake District supreme in all England. It then goes on to quote Wordsworth extensively. What is so interesting here is not only is Wordsworth being called upon as, as a leading voice in a government report on national parks, but that his is the only writer's voice to be featured. None of the other 11 area descriptions contain literary quotes. Such was the intense association that the area's very future was channeled through him. A few decades earlier, a guidebook by Eric Robertson entitled Wordsworthshire set out to precisely define the fictional county based around the poet's life and work. The book unashamedly defines a distinct geographical area formed out of the legacy of Wordsworth. Instead of a natural centre, Robertson selected Dove Cottage as the centre, and the inference is that the further the tourist strays from that point, the further they are from the true Lake District. Now the boundaries of the National Park echoed this. The National Parks Act was passed in 1949, and the Lake District was awarded National Park status in 1951. The Lake District has still faced battles to preserve its landscape. The increase in car ownership democratised access to the area, but has done a huge amount to destroy areas of it. The ecological awakening of the 60s and 70s brought extra energy to campaigns fought by organisations such as the CPRE, but also brought Wordsworth into play as a key voice on preservation. Over the last few decades, there has been a reassessment of Wordsworth's work in an environmental life, positioning him as an early key exponent of environmental principles. So it's clear then that Wordsworth isn't going away. His voice is certainly not the only one that has impacted on the formation of the area we know today as the Lake District. In fact, other people have argued that the true Lake District extends beyond the boundaries of the National Park. In truth, the boundaries of the Lake District will never be formally <coughs> fixed and marked upon a map. It will remain a topic of debate for years to come. But Wordsworth's legacy can be aligned most with the National Park. He shared his love of his native land in the writing which celebrated the healing properties of landscape, demonstrated a deeper connection with the land, threw a spotlight on local people and their lives, understood the delicate natural balance of the environment around him, and knew the importance of establish 
establishing some sort of protection for it. No wonder then that his voice has been called upon so often to speak for the Lake District. Thank you. So, actually, I came to love the Lake District long before I knew that Wordsworth existed. So, um, my parents um, took us to the Lake District virtually every year for a holiday. So, my attachment with the Lake District is firstly through that connection with childhood nostalgia um, and, you know, happy family holidays there. Um, but you slowly fall in love with the area. Um, you catch it at points where the light is doing very interesting things. Um, where it's very quiet, um, you can see the stars. Um, and then at A-level, I came across Wordsworth and went, oh, right, um, there's someone writing about the Lake District and they love it as much as I do, and they're expressing it in a way which I've come to love it for. So um, I've met loads of people that have come to love it through Wordsworth, but yeah, for me, it's, it's those moments. You read his work and you read these wonderful descriptions of intense moments of connection and you think this this can't be true but when you've seen for example the moon um, in reflected in the waters of Rydal water you, know, you come to understand exactly what he's talking about There's, there's an interesting quote in the introduction to that book where he talks about the experience of being um, in the school hall when he was a child and this person talking to the school about you know, the history of the Lake District and why it's so appreciated for its beauty. And he says something like, um, you know, none of us had ever heard of Wordsworth. You know, these are people who've grown up amongst the landscape and have never heard of Wordsworth. Um, so that kind of quote made me think about this kind of interpretation because by no means is this the only interpretation of the landscape. Um, when I worked at the Wordsworth Trust, we did a, uh, an exhibition called Land Keepers, which celebrated um, the sheep farmers of the Lake District. And actually listening to them and understanding their enthusiasm for the Lake District, because they still have enthusiasm for it, they just see it in a different way. For them to talk about the beauty of it and enjoying it certainly makes you think that you know, the early tourism is led by a very elite few, so um, it's interesting when you think about the area being defined by people almost outside of it. Wordsworth's a bit of an exception because he grew up there and he knew the landscape and he was a native of the region, but I can appreciate and understand the frustrations of having people elsewhere coming along and saying, well, actually, we think this is a really nice area, so we're going to draw a line around it and restrict what you can do within so it's a difficult debate, um, and yes, um, yeah. It just seems like words with more contemplation, I, I suppose, than before that the, the internet was about contemplation, where yeah, it's um, in the environment and sort of working it. Right? Yeah, um, Wordsworth, whilst he wasn't incredibly rich, had the time on his hands to go out walking and enjoying it, um, and to sit there and to reflect on it and to write it, um, and a lot of people you know, don't have that luxury so very much it's channeled whilst yes I can understand and appreciate what he's saying it's also someone who's had the chance like we have when we go on holiday there to properly sit and just stare at a view and appreciate it. I was um, fascinated by the Claude mirrors. Oh yes. Um, and I was just thinking today if you went to the Lake District and you saw that view 
I mean, I imagine these are your photographs as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but, I mean, you're a very talented photographer, but actually, for most people, they'll be standing there with a the phone taking a selfie or doing something. And I just thought there's an interesting kind of parallel today. But we, we, you know, in the same way that they were satirised, we see that as a kind of like shallow form of looking. Mm. Like, you know, Wordsworth is telling you you should kind of breathe it all in mm. and contemplate it. And people are trying to make it manageable. You know, like the idea that you can get it in this like little microcosm, mm. and you know maybe we should be easier on people who are taking selfies today. You know, in you know in art classes, people sometimes use photography because it flattens the perspective and mm. makes it easier to kind of to imitate. And um, yeah, so I was just thinking, you know, about um, that idea of trying to capture and pin down something that's huge and terrible, and you know how it kind of still occurs today. Yeah, a wide-angle lens is useful for that, but <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it. <laughs> I'll admit that there have been moments where I've been enjoying a view and someone's come along and just walked up and just hit yeah. you know, capture on their phone and I think, gosh, you haven't even actually looked at yeah. it yet. But <laughs> I, can, I can appreciate what they're doing and I think you know, we look back at some of the artworks that have been produced through this period and as a result of using a clawed glass and we go, oh yes, fantastic. But actually, like you say, people today are basically you know, descendants of that. They are using the equipment that they've got and they're going along to capture it. Um, so it's, you have to try and be a little bit fair, you know, especially if people haven't seen landscapes like this before, that what they are trying to do is effectively what the sketches did back in the 18th century. They're just trying to take a piece of what they've experienced mm -hmm. away with them. Mm -hmm. I might just jump in with a thought or a question or a bit of a point again. I'm struck by some of the dates here. Where's where died in? This is uh, only a handful of years after, I'm bringing it back to the, the broader theme here, <laughs> only a handful of years after the Folklore Society, uh, or, the, or the term folklore comes into being, which is 1846. It's also not that long after um, the British Archaeological Association is founded, which is also in the 1840s, which these are sort of processes that give rise to the Folklore Society being established in 1878. Mm. You know, this is something fixed on very small packages of, of activity, performance, narrative, story, quite fixed, collectible things. And the British Archaeological Association, some of that gives rise to the Ancient Monuments Protection Act, which I think is about 1882 or thereabouts. Again, about fixed sites, and I'm struck by the connection with that back to the almost antiquarian period maps that you were showing right at the beginning yeah. from the, the late 18th century, where it's all about navigating a landscape through sites. And what Wordsworth does is something that connects mm. those. He's, he's not that fixed on sites yeah. and specific mm. places within the landscape. Mm. He's doing something that's much more fluid and dynamic and about experiential, sort of lived in phenomenological life in the landscape. So, so not James Rebanks, mm. perhaps, yes. but a different form of experiencing and living in the landscape. And I wonder whether that's got a connection to the fact that these landscape protecting forces, which merged to some extent with the National Trust in the late 19th century, but really gained ground post First World War, there, you know, it takes a good century on from Wordsworth's death for that to happen, to understand that the landscape itself can be preserved. It doesn't have to do fixed points and things within it. Yeah. Is, is that Wordsworth's legacy solely is it a much more complex thing i mean in in your narrative it seems that it's wordsworth and that's quite a powerful mm. idea but I, I don't know whether you have any thoughts on um that. it's probably a lot more complex i mean it's not just wordsworth but he you know positions that guidebook in amongst others that are fixed on sites um, and kind of blows that open um, I mean, it does. His his guidebook does mention specific sites, specific places, um, towns, villages, that kind of thing. But the bits where he's most intensely connecting with the landscape are those kind of broad sweeps. You know, it could be anywhere. This just happens to be my experience. Um, and yeah, it's it's interesting because um, it's actually the people that come after him and during his lifetime that are fixed on sites. His poems, like I said in the kind of the poems of naming places, are very specific to places that connect to him. So he might refer to, I don't know, Sarah's Point or John's Gate or something like that. It's the people coming after him 
point sometimes that have gone out treasure hunting almost. They've gone, right, this description, this, ah, it must be this gate or it must be this, um, you know, shepherd's or whatever um, it is. Um, and that comes out of the kind of hunger by tourists, almost out of that pre-Wordsworth fixing on sites and people desiring to be taken to a point and go, right, this is one of the best views you're going to get or this was where Wordsworth wrote this poem, or this is where Wordsworth got this inspiration from. So I don't know what you think about that in terms of his legacy. Those sites meant a lot to him, but obviously he's quite consciously writing them down and publishing them. But I think if you know he saw the amount of people that turned up at a certain point today just because he happened to think of a poem there, he might be a bit shocked. He wouldn't, he wouldn't do that with the selfies, but he'd do that with the one down the road. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> um, we've mentioned Beatrix Potter, but I can't help thinking about another children's writer, Arthur Ransom. Yes. For three reasons. Um, I think, you know, in Spoilers and Ransoms, for mm -hmm. example, you get a little bit of transcendentalism, and the children do appreciate the landscape and live to the hills. But there's also a recognition of the people that work on the land. So you have the farm shop, which are called the and yes. so on. Um, but the other thing, that in relation to what you've just been saying, is the way that the children make the landscape their own, so their maps mm -hmm. rename mm -hmm. various points um, on, on the water. Um, so I'm not really, I'm not really mm -hmm. sure what's it was just a connection in my head. But, but I, I think that's something that we all do, really. If you come to live somewhere and you become so familiar with it, even if you don't write down, oh, I'm going to rename this spot this, mm -hmm. you're very aware, particularly yourself, your family or your friends that have associations with that place, but that's a very powerful link, but it's something very personal to you. And I think we all do it, whether consciously or unconsciously, which is why I think reading that, you know, you think, oh, actually, yes, this I do this as well. That's what we call psychogeography. Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> I think whilst you can use Wordsworth as a way of interpreting the landscape or a way of kind of saying your own personal interpretation of this landscape is valid, um, I think it's quite dangerous. I mean, I feel like I'm undermining a bit of my argument here, but it's a bit dangerous to hold just one person's account of the landscape up as being the account. Um, you know, the National Park is not there simply because of Wordsworth. Um, but defining a, a, a landscape based on one person and saying this is his experience, your experience must be channeled through this, has the risk of ignoring the people that are there in the landscape themselves. Um, I mentioned that exhibition that was at the Wordsworth Trust, but you know the reason that the landscape looks so beautiful is because farmers have been farming it for so long, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know people can forget that they come with this idea of experience, a romantic landscape, a picturesque landscape of Wordsworth, but they forget the work that goes into managing that landscape, and actually that some of those techniques perhaps go against or push against some of those kind of protection arguments. Um, so I think we have to be mindful as well as sort of clinging to this landscape as being something with which we should protect, you know, something that Wordsworth pushes forward, but to understand that actually there's a balance to be had there. I'm going to introduce another name, which is Wainwright. Yes. Um, because a lot of us here, I came to know the Lake District through walking and Wainwright and Wordsworth came later when I did my degree. And again, I'll build the lady who asked about the conservation, and I'm aware that Ramblers, HF, and the people who walk are very keen on this conservation of the walking paths. Um, so there is an element there of, of still the awareness mm -hmm. that while we love this place and want to walk here and read about it and enjoy the poetry, we all have to work for that conservation. Yeah, absolutely. How, how, would you, how do you feel about that? I think, yeah, when you go up and some of the most the more popular fells, the, kind of the, the more popular Wainwright fells, and you see the damage that's been done to paths. You know, this path that's gone from originally being this very narrow very to being very wide, yeah. um, you know, bits of mud, people are wandering around to, to avoid that, and they're carving out and destroying bits of it. That 
the sense that the National Trust, they offer kind of holidays where you can go and be part of that, almost that chance to give back yeah. to the landscape, you know. Um, Wainwright's interesting because, um, you know, he is one of those kind of, you almost say sort of working middle class people from, from Lancashire that comes up because it's a, it's a weekend pursuit. You know, you can afford to catch the bus up to the Lake District and go walking. Um, and, you know, whilst Wordsworth's a bit elitist and you read it these days and you think, gosh, that's quite awful what he's saying, his core point is that, you know, it should be protected for the whole of the nation. Um, and luckily, the sort of modern, more democratic interpretations have been taken forward for that so that we have chance to explore and enjoy it but also to be aware that our actions on some occasions destroy it. I think there's one time for one more question. Could we come to a point where the number of visitors will have to be limited? Maybe. Um, it's difficult really because the whole point, one of the big points of the National Park is to protect it for the nation so that visitors can come and can see it. Um, 15.8 million visitors a year compared to with what I don't know the 50,000 sort of native population it's a huge increase and I've seen it firsthand people coming in on coaches I think there are ways that you can improve things in terms of local transport maybe limiting access with cars um, making it accessible whilst limiting the amount of sort of individual vehicles um, it's a shame, really, because the arguments against the railway is actually if they'd have been built, they would have offered a better uh, way of accessing the landscape without bringing cars onto it, but mm -hmm. unfortunately that's not how things were seen then. Um, I don't know. It would be very odd. You'd have to set up a system of sort of saying, actually, no, we've got enough visitors. I don't even think you'd be able to monitor the amount, so I'd be interested to see what happens with that. Well, that complex right? Um, just a quick reminder that Adam's got some fascinating collections out in the seminar room. I think we might have to sort of go through there in, in, in phases so that we don't overwhelm the, the space and the collections. Uh, hopefully Adam will be on hand to yes. talk us through that material uh, and, and, and show it to you. And I'm sure he'll be on hand to answer some questions as well. Um, very quickly, before we thank Adam again for a magnificent, magnificent end to the current series, a uh, quick reminder again of the, the phone plate from the frontier. A pilgrim trail around museums, galleries, uh, you can make your own pilgrim badge. There is a, there is a logical connection between this and Reading, so come and find out more. Uh, I'll be making balloon hats, there'll be loads of exciting stuff. Poetry recitals as well, uh, not Wordsworth, but uh, our own Bobby Robinson, um, Neil Cox from the, the University's English Department. Uh, lots of exciting stuff. Bring your instrument and jam with Magpie Lane. Yeah, so if you're, if you're a musician, Magpie Lane will be playing, and they're happy for people to bring their own instruments. Uh, I not to bring you an instrument because I'm busy over there. But uh, Adam, that was absolutely magnificent. Thank you, Thank you for such a brilliant. <laughs>